We return to the imaginative world of Edgar Allan Poe. Today we are discussing, analyzing, breaking down the oval portrait. Could you imagine being such a good artist that you could capture life? Yeah, there, there reminds me of um, another story that we've read in the past. Well, we'll come back to that. So let's talk about editing too, because when it comes to Poe creating this craft and writing this, this has actually been heavily edited. It's like he wanted it to be much more fine-tuned. I think it was like over 400 words were cut from it. Did, did you know some of the background behind this? I did not. I just read it and enjoyed it and was like, wow, this is an, another killer story, pun intended. Yeah, well, so the reason why he got wounded, I guess, the reason uh, why he might be seeing things is made explicit in the edited version, So, so or in the unedited version. So he obviously wanted to take that away to leave us, the reader, to have a lot more of the interpretation game and a lot less solidified as opposed to what we should be interpreting, which I think is what's really interesting with this story. I mean, the story does have a big air of mystery, right? I mean, we have a very vague setting of the chateau that's decrepit. That's like all we kind of know. We don't know really much about the plot. We know that the main character is injured some sort and takes refuge in this decrepit house. And then the story kind of goes away from there. So we, we don't know a lot, which you get to create a lot of the story in your head. And that that's fun sometimes, although... It can be irritating, of course, when you want to know a little bit more details about it, but that's Poe for you. Well, and this is actually a very good example of some of the Gothic literature, right? Because a lot of times you have elements of supernatural and setting usually plays a huge part in Gothic literature. And here there's something just a little bit off about this place, right? Like when he walks in, first of all, okay, walks in, he forces himself in, okay, and there's nobody there. He finds this volume, almost like the mint on the pillow at the hotel, like inviting him <laughs> to read it, right? Yeah. And everything, you know, like you've got like this room with all these fancy pictures just out and about, and he's got to move the candelabra to to read it. There, There's something to say about how Poe uses the setting for his stories. For sure. It, it feels inviting, but the, you can tell that there's an ominous overtone as well. Some of those key words really kind of striking a leeriness to do I want to go on this adventure? What is going to be the end? <laughs> yeah, I would say it's gloomy, right? And when he starts to look at this picture, that's when it, uh, I'm going to use the word comes alive for him. The, the quote is actually least of all, could it have been that my fancy shaken from its half slumber had mistaken the head for that of a living person. I saw it once that the peculiarities of the design, of the vignetting, and of the frame must have instantly dispelled such idea, must have prevented even its momentary entertainment. So we have this kind of like combination of he's looking at this art and feeling that it's real, but then it's like once he sees the borders around it, he's like, oh yeah, that's right, I'm, I'm looking at a painting, right? In the same way that Poe writes this story, that we're reading and interpreting, but we're, we're engaging with art, which, you know, a lot of times they say art remix life, but at the same time, life seems to mimic art too. So it's kind of raising this question to me of what is the relationship between art and life? I think that's the crux of the story of when does art become too lifelike and it loses its appeal. And I feel like that's kind of what the narrator is saying is, it was so realistic and then it was easily broken. It was, it was, you know, like glass. It's beautiful to look at, but it's easily shattered because just the distinction of the painting itself to its, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Case, um, portrait, border, whatever broke the spell for him. So if something is so good, when does it become too good? Oh, that's really interesting. How do you then kind of compare that with, because next the volume, like, so you had that volume that he was reading that gives background on each of the paintings. And in that volume, we learned that the the woman that the, the portrait is of had married this painter, right? So who better to draw a picture that knows the intimate real you than what would be your stereotypical husband? But that's what this volume reveals is there's actually kind of a fragile to your points and words relationship between the 
the subject of the woman and the painter, where the painter just got like so obsessed with with painting that he never doted on her, never paid her any attention. She was like background material almost. This is where, of course, the story really takes off for me because you have somebody that I think might be infatuated, as we've talked about many times before. What is love? Uh, there is, you know, a physical love to where you're physically attracted to somebody, friendship, love, 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 children to, to mother love, all that. So this painter infatuated with this woman, right? And then he thinks she's beautiful, falls in love with her and starts to paint her. But where does the relationship become toxic? Where is it that she never, where is it that she doesn't stay? hold up to his standards anymore maybe she did at one point in time so he's trying to recapture that essence of what she was because maybe she is aging and he's trying to bring back that beauty that he was obsessed with and then we see the story kind of move into there of how she fails him and then he fails her as a husband Okay, that kind of reminds me of one of those Borges stories where you're trying to kind of like capture time in memoriam Um, I, I didn't have that same view I almost maybe I misread it, but it kind of made me feel that he was always kind of neglectful of her. Like he was never really giving her attention. And it reminds me of that situation of like, you know, those people that become so obsessed with something, an art, a a hobby. You know, one of my friends got obsessed with climbing and it was like, everything he talked about was climbing after, (laughs) (laughs) which is fine to like climbing. But it's like when, when that's the only way you can relate it feels like it might cut off some ways in relationships that you could have in your life. Right. And this painter, for me, it's like he became so obsessed with creation and art. It was never about the perfect picture of her for how I read it. It was about how he just became so obsessed with art that that, that obsession is what then disconnected his, his humanity and ultimately what made the love, I believe the narrative called it evil for her. I think we're kind of on the same page, though, because I feel like that the relationship is still there, right? He he's obsessed more with the art than he is with his wife now. And their relationship has changed the dynamic between them. And we see that, I think, a lot of times in our own lives. Most of you could probably relate that when you get married single day, you have all these things in common. And then over time, you might slowly grow apart. You know, I become obsessed with something and my wife becomes obsessed with something else and we don't have as much in common. And I think that that can be the case here. And I I think that to your point is that the husband went down a negative avenue and the wife trying to be a good spouse went down with him. And because maybe she was the center of his obsession, it brought them both down. Mm, interesting, interesting. I've been really kind of like pondering what this meant and it, I can't believe it, but I was actually reading like on the side of this comic, it, we, you know, the opposite of Poe in a sense. But what's interesting about this is it's about artists and how they basically, in order to become these comic artists, they've had to give up their lives, their youth. They, they traded in their youth in the same way that they talk about, like, you know, kind of like how a vampire sucks away the youth of, of young women. So too does this woman give away her youth to try to be the the wife for this man who's instead obsessed with art, right? And, th- and there's actually this really interesting quote here where they talk about basically that all young men around your age go to the mountains and beaches with their girlfriends and enjoy their youth. This may be different from enjoying one's youth, which you're talking about. But I have experienced a burning passion many times upon those final drafts covered in ink. I'm not like those guys who are barely sizzling. It may only be a fraction of a second, and I'll burn with bright red flames. And all that will be left afterwards is white ash. Which I think is very poetic. It's, it's you know, a reference within a reference there, but... That idea of obsession, when does it become a negative? Because we have the white ash, right? If you are so obsessed with something, sometimes that's the only way you're going to really leave that that mark upon the world, right? If Edgar Allan Poe hadn't dedicated his, his craft to writing these perfect stories where everything led to one thing, 
would we know who Edgar Allan Poe is? Would we have these amazing stories had he not sacrificed so much for it? Poe himself had a very addictive personality himself too that I think it's easy to say this man was obsessive because it did cause harm, right, to this woman. But I think it asks the question too, how does obsession become healthy and how does obsession also create good things for many people as well? There's always that fine line between love and hate. And I think there's that fine line between life and death. And we see that in the portrait. It's an encapsulating life. And for that to be able to happen, there had to be a death. There had to be a sacrifice. And his wife was it. And you'll notice that life was capitalized at the end, right? That mm -hmm. last, I think it was yep. the last sentence. But then also art was capitalized a couple of times. So clearly Poe wanted us to ask that question between life and art. Right. When do you when do you have to give one up? Do you have to give one up? And what does it mean? Because the the in the edited version of the story, it ends with this is indeed life itself and turned suddenly to his beloved, uh, turned suddenly to regard his beloved. She was dead. So, right. It, it's kind of like he transferred life from her in, in the time to be immortalized, like like yeah. she became his white ash essentially in the story where his dedication to the craft is what allowed him to immortalize her through art and to an extent Poe through literature. Isn't that the, the kicker is that she is immortalized, even though she died, she exists forever. And here we are still talking about her hundreds of years later. <laughs> yeah. Now, how would you feel if you knew that there was one more sentence in the unedited version? Do you want to know what it was? I do. I do. I don't know if our viewers do. So if you don't, peace. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Stay, stay, stay around. It'll be fun. Hit me. All right. So the, so the last deleted line was, but is this indeed death when he's just finished proclaiming that this is life and death is in capital? Ooh, interesting. No, yeah. it kind of gives it a little bit more of a, a defined purpose and I feel like adding the life and death is probably a little bit unnecessary, but when you're already comparing life and art, like it probably like confused things a little bit too much, but uh, def definitely an interesting way to have edited the story to be, a, a, I think, is this his most compact short story potentially? I I'm trying to think of what would possibly be shorter besides like his poems. Uh, I think it is one of, if not the shortest story he has. I don't think it's the shortest, but it, it's definitely top three of his shortest stories. And it's a great little compact story that you can get a lot out of. It has a lot of mileage for being so short. Well, let's keep reading Poe. Playlist down below of other Edgar Allan Poe talks until we can find one that is potentially shorter. My name is Ben Una. Thank you for spending time with us. Peace. Happy Halloween, if I haven't said it. Peace. <laughs>